I want to welcome you to the MRES events. And uh, um, Alan's been involved with electric vehicles, uh, like the uh, slide says, for over 10 years. I've known him uh, for all of that time and then some. And uh, he just has a tremendous knowledge of EVs and really, really great at explaining the idiosyncrasies, whatever the heck you say, <laughs> for, for the different things that uh, involved electric vehicles. And he said to me one day uh, a number of years ago, he said, you know, Doug, I don't know if I'm driving a car. I think maybe I'm driving a computer. And, and if you look at the way cars are nowadays, that's, that's a very true statement. So we want to welcome him to uh, this presentation. And Alan, you can take it from here, okay? All right. Thanks, Doug. I appreciate it. Yeah, it is kind of a laptop on wheels. Uh, we'll get into that conversation throughout the night. So this is Electric Vehicles 101. Uh, my name is Alan Wernke. I'm an electric, electric car, electric vehicle evangelist. I've been doing this for 10 years. I know for some people that's like, is it really that long? I mean, yeah, if you bought an early uh, uh, Mitsubishi Leaf, or I'm sorry, uh, a Nissan Leaf, or you bought an early Tesla Model S, you uh, could very easily be at 10 years. I think the early Model S has started shipping in the spring 10 years ago. I got mine. Uh, it'll be like one more week. I was actually 12, 10 years ago this week, I was installing my uh, charger in my, my garage. And um, this is my third EV. This is, uh, I'm driving a Tesla Model 3 long range. And uh, people always joke, it's like, well, how can you ban your third car in 10 years, Alan? They must not be doing very well for you. And I always say that, well, there's a lot of people that like to buy used EVs because they're a really great value. So they hold their value really well over time. Uh, I think I'm about 150,000 miles, all electric, no gas. I've traveled around the United States, up into Canada. I've done the circle tour. Uh, I've been out to California a number of times, Colorado, up through New Mexico. Drove to Florida uh, a week after getting this car that you're seeing here on the picture. That was an interesting trip. We can talk about that later on. Um, but uh, yeah, if you have any questions uh, around electric cars or charging, feel free to write down that phone number or that email, give me a call, give me a text, whatever. Uh, and we'll set up some time, jump on another video call and uh, dive into it. So with that, uh, jump into the passenger seat and let's go for a little ride through Electric Vehicles 101. Uh, so these are basically some of the questions that I've been getting in some form or another over the 10 years. Obviously they've evolved. I've added some new ones when gas kind of hit $5. A lot of people started asking questions around that, but I'll go through these questions and hopefully I'll be done in about 30 minutes or less, and then we'll jump into your questions. So if you have questions, put them in the chat and I will stay on as long as it takes to answer all your questions or we'll set up a one-on-one, -on -one, okay? So the first question, why drive an electric vehicle? Well, you know, I'll say five to 10 years ago, this was kind of the question, like, are you crazy? Why do you do this, right? Um, and I, I think it's really three main reasons. One is to save money. One is to do my part to save the earth. And I'm having a little fun along the way, as you'll find out. Uh, I don't feel like I'm really, quote unquote, sacrificing too much here, to be honest. Um, I do believe in climate change. Uh, I, transportation is the number one source of climate causing pollution in Minnesota and the United States. And I think we have a very easy answer to that problem. Uh, we just need to start plugging in our vehicles more. Um, total cost of ownership for an electric vehicle is really one of the main drivers for me. I'll be honest, I like to save some money. I like a good value. Um, I can drive 20,000 miles a year for $200 of electricity for fuel. Uh, people often like, are you sure you got that number right, Alan? I'm like, oh yeah, I'm, I, I'm, I'm a data analytics guy. I've been keeping track. Um, it's, it, the key is to get that off peak overnight rate from your utility. It's, I drive for about a penny a mile. So it's a, a super low way to go. And you know, it's an electric motor, <laughs> a laptop as we like to call it, or an iPad screen and a big battery. So uh, there's not a lot of moving parts there. Actually, one of the numbers I read the other day was there's 2000 moving parts in the gas engine and about 20 in an electric motor. And I would tell you that that right there summarizes a lot of the maintenance issues. We'll talk about that more in detail, but that's an interesting number. Um, I don't have a tailpipe, so it's kind of a, a zero emissions vehicle. Now, of course, it does matter how much, you know, what I'm putting into it for fuel, where it's generated and how it's 
generated. That's a real key part of it. But even if I were to use dirty electricity, quote unquote, it's still 85% cleaner over the life of the vehicle. And that number, many people way underestimate that number. They think it's more, you know, it's, it, it's dramatically different to drive a clean vehicle. Uh, why is because we have a grid in Minnesota that's about 40% clean energy. So uh, sun, wind, water, you know, et cetera, nuclear power, carbon free sources, we're about 40%. So that really matters to the car and the emissions overall. Um, as far as the driving experience, I tell people it's kind of like an electric, uh, maybe a magic carpet. I know that's kind of a crazy analogy, but it's smooth, it's fast, it's powerful, but yet it's really quiet. And uh, people love to drive it. I tell you, every everybody that I take for a ride in the car or take for a drive, they all are just like, wow, it's just so powerful, but yet I don't hear anything. It's kind of, it's just a weird, weird feeling, but I love it. And people say that all the time. I would say that like nine and a half people out of 10 that I give a ride to really enjoy the experience. People that I've actually had people that I've taken for rides that are into classical music and they have to put their favorite classical music song on while we're driving. And they swear they've heard new parts of the song that they've never heard before. I, I, this kind of stuff happens all the time because of the quietness. Uh, I also like some of the creature comforts. Um, not going to the gas station is a really nice thing. Uh, the other day I took my wife's plug-in Prius to the gas station and the guy wanted to buy the car from me as I was putting water softener salt in, which I thought was hilarious. I also um, was at the gas station the other day uh, getting, <laughs> getting some uh, other supplies. I think I got milk or something. And there was a guy who put $100 worth of diesel in his truck. And he said, yeah, it's not full, but that's all the money I got today. And I, and I was sitting there with my all electric car. And I was like, I just couldn't go into it with them. I really had to just kind of walk away and leave it there. But it was an interesting situation. Um, so one of the questions I've been getting more frequently is why EVs now? So if you know the history of automobiles, back in the early 1900s, we had electric cars. They ran on lead acid batteries. Um, I would tell you that the battery has really changed. And we've kind of hit what I call that tipping point, both in dollars and range. Um, I kind of make the analogy, it's kind of like when the Wright brothers learn how to fly an airplane, you know, um, it's just humans have figured out how to drive an electric car. It's just a battery and some controls and a motor, right? Um, the battery price has really dropped over the last 10 years, 87% uh, down is what Bloomberg New Energy Finance mentioned. And you can see that the pack and the cell prices have come down considerably. We're on a little bit of a hold right now, but it's... Um, you know, going to drop again after we get through the COVID and the supply chain issues. There's been such a strain on the supply chain trying to keep up with demand because, as you know, everybody's switching, you know, all the traditional um, automobile manufacturers are switching over to electric. Um, so all of a sudden, it's like we just need a massive change in minerals and things like that. So the energy density is up and the cost is dropping down. And that's really the fundamental situation. So there's gas cars, there's hybrids, there's plug-in hybrids, and there's all electric vehicles. So what is an electric car is really the question. Um, they don't all use gas. You can have a car that is specifically built to run on just an electric motor and a battery. So the key thing here is to look at the plug. The plug is what really matters. And that's what brings the magic. That's what allows you to charge the battery that's built into the car, right? So you can have a gas engine and a gas tank and an electric motor and a battery. So think of this as kind of a, an older hybrid, like a, a Prius or something like that. And then you can have a plug-in version where you add that 20, 30, 40, or like in a Chevy Volt, 50 miles of range by plugging the car in. And there's a super amount of efficiency there between the electric motor and the gas motor. And the plug is what brings that magic. And so in an all electric car, you have electric motor and then the bigger battery to go with that. So that's kind of what describes it is when you have the plug, okay? All right, so let's switch into more, a little bit of an overview of what's going on with electric cars at the worldwide level, uh, the North America level and in the Minnesota level, okay? So here in the chart on the left-hand side, you can see what the number of vehicle sales have been. The blue is China, purple is Europe, the US is green, 
and then we have Canada, South Korea. You can just see the massive number of units that have ramped up in China and Europe over the last, I don't know, two, three years here. Uh, this is primarily due to emission limits and controls that the European Union has put on to their, you know, their country and a framework to reduce emissions over time. Uh, I also like to point out that the U.S. slice of the pie here is not very big. That's the green one, as you can see here going back. Um, and this goes back to 2017. And you think, well, geez, you know, you can see back in the early <laughs> days just how few vehicles there were. My first Tesla Model S was 26,000 VIN number. My first Model 3 was 7,000 VIN number. And my current Model 3 is 987,000 VIN number. Um, and there's just been a lot of change in the space, but you can kind of see where things are going. Um, it's been changing rapidly. Um, as far as manufacturers, those are this column right here in the blue. Tesla is the world's largest maker of EVs. Um, BYD is a China company, of course, and you know Volkswagen is Europe. So you can see kind of the volume level and how things have changed. What's interesting is when you look at the models and the uh, vehicles around the world, Tesla has three of the top 10 selling EVs on the face of the earth. Now that number is going to change pretty dramatically uh, as Tesla loses share but gains more units over time, right? So Ford and GM and all the traditional automakers are coming for Tesla over the next you know, five, 10 years. Um, it's going to be a big change and interesting ride. But Tesla still, I think the last number I saw was over 50% market share. And so it's kind of like two to one. And we see that here in Minnesota as well. So let's talk about the United States and where we are. Um, some of the trends that I'm tracking out there that I see, uh, auto execs now believe that half of the US car sales will be electric in North America by 2030. So we're eight years out from kind of the tipping point of more electric cars will be sold than gas cars. That was a little bit in question before the Inflation Reduction Act, but that has been clearly uh, cemented and we've seen massive commitment from the traditional automakers that they will no longer make or sell a gas engine car after 2040. So we're starting to see kind of the curve ramp up pretty quickly. Um, people find that pretty surprising, to be honest. I'm out usually presenting, um, I'd say at least one or two times a week this presentation in the Rotary Club, um, League of Women Voters or other organizations around the metro area or as part of my job. So people uh, don't realize just kind of how far we are behind in this space compared to Europe and China. The Minnesota Department of Transportation has an ambitious goal to have 20% of the vehicles on the road electric in Minnesota. So we have about 5 million vehicles, actually a little more than that, but around that number. So that would be about 1 million cars are going to plug in in eight years. That's a pretty big change. Um, people are still trying to get their head around that. And do they have, do they have, can they get a car? Will they get a car? When will they get a car? How do they plug it in? There's a lot of learning that needs to be done. That's kind of one of the reasons why I do this presentation. Um, Minnesota becomes a clean car state in January of 2024 for the 25 models. So we are joining the clean car state coalition of states across the United States. It just means that we'll probably have a little broader selection of plug-in cars in Minnesota on the parking lot. Um, we, won't, we won't be getting them from Colorado and California anymore. We'll actually have them here locally to buy. Um, as you probably have heard the news from California that they're planning to phase out gas powered car sales by 2035. Again, that sounds very aggressive for a lot of people. You have to understand California is a market that is one of the largest on the face of the earth as just a state. They're one of the top 10 marketplaces in the world. Um, number nine is what they technically rank as. So um, they're just keeping up with Europe and China, uh, really. I mean, this is not that aggressive when you compare it to China and Europe. Uh, it looks aggressive to the rest of the US, but um, I would say they're just keeping pace. So we have to consider that. Uh, the European Union has already banned the internal combustion engine uh, after 2035, and as have many countries around the world. And if we want to go there, I have a slide about that later on. Uh, we're starting to see $25,000 EVs um, from several manufacturers. I expect to have a lot more choice uh, at that price point going forward. And that might just be the sticker price. You also have to factor in how much lower the fuel cost is and the maintenance. 
So we've already passed the peak year of gas car sales back in 2017. Tesla has shipped multiple millions of units now and is starting to go down. It's kind of already tipped. This uh, graphic on the right here is a little bit old from 2018, but it's still very representative of where the electric vehicle registrations are in the US. Uh, the darker the blue, the more cars that are electric in that state or that plug in. Um, primarily, it's the east and the west coast. Uh, Minnesota, I think, will probably start turning a lot darker blue here in this graphic. Um, as we move forward. What's missing from this list uh, here is you don't see it, but uh, almost all of these blue or darker blue uh, states are part of the clean uh, car coalition. So they all have a higher emissions uh, framework in place than the US governments, right? So uh, we'll see us turn to a darker blue from that perspective. All right, let's keep moving. Let's get into Minnesota. So. If you have, I'm going to stop here because this is a really important slide and it's got a lot of information. What I want you to remember is this link in the upper left hand corner. Minnesota now has a fantastic EV dashboard from the Department of Transportation. If you just search for this electric vehicle dashboard, Minnesota DOT, you'll find a really in depth amount of information. I tried to grab some of the screenshots and put them on here. This is not even half of them. I think there's like 30 different graphics out there. But you can start to see, you know, we're at about 28, 29,000 vehicles on the road right now. And this was just updated as of a month ago. This is going to be changing fairly rapidly as we go forward. But like, what is the average vehicle range on the road? And I want to point out, this is not a forecast. This is who are paying license tabs in the state of Minnesota. These are registered vehicles. So there's nothing future or planned about this. These are people that paid to drive this car in Minnesota. So this is factual information. You can see how many different types of vehicles we have, how many per household, where are the charging stations? Yes, it looks pretty red for Tesla. It's getting a lot bluer and greener as we go forward. Uh, the number of chargers that we have in the state and how fast they are, how far people are commuting, uh, how many fast chargers we have over the state and what we expect for growth on that pers perspective going forward. Uh, average MSRP, what they're paying taxes on. And these two down here in the corner, I love these two stats. So remember this, about 30% of the people in Minnesota live in a condo or an apartment. They do not live in their own home. And I will talk about that specifically because that's an area that I focus on every day. And then EVs on the road. This bottom right number, I really just have to focus on this because so many people say, oh, EVs don't work in the snow in Minnesota. Yeah, it's a real problem. I can't make it work, et cetera. And I'm like, well, that's interesting. Two thirds of the vehicles on the road in Minnesota are all electric cars, not plug-in hybrids. So if they're working, I don't know, it's kind of telling me that they do work. <laughs> so I always get that question and I will address that with a whole slide. But uh, just remember, these are the factual numbers. You can go see this dashboard. There's a lot more information out there than, um, than I'm presenting here in this one. So I, there's one out there that is the top 10 cars on the road in Minnesota with a plug. I converted that information into pictures because it's just a lot easier to get through in a shorter period of time than dig through that graphic on there. Tesla Model 3 out in front here, that is the number one selling car by far that's electric in Minnesota, the Tesla Model Y. The Chevy Volt continues to hang on with a large number of people registered. People love this car. It's 50 miles and it's a hybrid. So you could drive, you know, what I would say most days here in town and, uh, you know, you never even kick in the gas engine. So it was a very economical car to drive in the long run and it's been holding up very well. I have two friends with this car and they still love it after all these years. Um, the Nissan Leaf is in fourth place and they've got a couple new models out. I have two friends driving those and they love them and I've driven them and I can see why we did a, a car swap. Um, this other red one over here is the Tesla Model S. The Chevy Bolt here is in the middle and the Tesla Model Y is right here. Or, I'm sorry, Model X is right there. Uh, Chrysler Pacifica van, very popular van, 35 miles on electric, and then it switches over to gas, so it's a great hauler. Uh, I know several people with this van. This was actually EV car of the year, like four or five years ago, and it's still doing really well for people. Uh, Ford Energy, uh, plug-in hybrid, kind of like the Chevy Volt, or Bolt and Volt were here. This is the Volt sister, if you want to think of it that way. Those are both popular at the same time. 
And then here in the bottom right is the plug-in Prius. And how many of you saw the new news this week that uh, the next generation of the Prius came out? They upped it to 36 miles on all electric. So if you're a Prius lover, uh, you will be very excited about that. All right, so cars. Where's my list? Right here somewhere. I had a whole list. Um, I get this question a lot. Where do I find out like all the cars? And I always say, this is the list. Thank you to the American Lung Association and Yuka Kukkonen at Shift to Electric. This is the list that they keep updated. This is now five pages deep. You can go through it and look at it. It's basically all the stats on cars that plug in. Model, name, how many it seats, all wheel drive, pricing, discount credits, battery size, range, safety rating, how fast it charges. It's all on these sheets and it's all available for you at evinfolist.com. So if you wanna know anything about an electric car or a hybrid, evinfolist.com, go there and check it out. All right, so we've talked a lot about cars, where they are in the world, where we are in Minnesota. Let's switch to what I say is the peanut butter and jelly. <laughs> this is the other half of the situation, which is how do I charge? We're gonna go through that a little bit and then we're gonna start digging into some more questions. Um, there's really kind of an AC story here and a DC story, right? So 120 volts, 240 volts, those are both AC. Uh, we have a standard or a conversation starter, I guess you'd call it in the EV world of, it's power or time when you plug in the car. If you want to charge it fast, then you plug into a lot of power. If you're okay with the time, you let it go overnight or whatever, you don't have to have a lot of power, right? So the other thing I wanted to make a comment is this is kind of a misinformation piece out there, I would say, that is any car, any EV can plug into just a 120-volt outlet. It will charge slow, but it will charge and it will work, and it does work with the cable that comes in the car. OK, so that outlet that your computer's plugged into right now, that will charge your car. That will charge an EV about five miles per hour. And whenever I present this, people are like, oh, Alan, five miles per hour, I'd be there all day. And I said, well, that's the goal. Cars sit 90 percent of the time. You don't have seven, eight, 10 hours overnight for your car to plug in. Average American drives 30 to 40 miles a day. So if you just leave your car plugged into 120 overnight, it's going to recharge. Right. And this is what people do. I call that the traveling cord. I like to leave it in the trunk of the car as a backup. I am a big fan of putting in a charger or a wall unit in your garage so that you can tap into a 240 volt circuit. So you can get an electrician to wire that for you. You can buy the unit as long as it's UL listed. Make sure you don't buy some cheaper unit that is not UL listed. You do not want to bring that fire risk into your house or wiring problems and things like that. So that's my one caveat. I get that quality. Hey, so what can you recommend for EV charging? And I said, well, there's probably 300 to choose from. Just make sure it's UL listed. And do you want to have the app and all that that talks to the charger on the wall? That's key. But it just uses a standard NEMA 1450 outlet. So a welder's plug or an electric dryer outlet is what the electrician's going to put in your garage. And you're going to get somewhere from 20 to 60 miles per hour of charge. Definitely enough to fill up overnight. So when you're on the road, then you plug into what I call the electric gas pump here on the right side, uh, maybe 60 to 200 miles, depends upon the car. And I would say if you have an EV that's within the last five years, you're probably looking at a closer to 20 minutes for 150 to 200 miles, um, like the new Teslas and um, several of the other cars like the Volkswagen ID4, things like that that are more of a newer model EV, you can count on 175 miles in 15 minutes or maybe 200 miles in 20 minutes. So it's very easy to road trip. I've got a couple slides in that later. Um, going and, and people go, well, can you like put that into context for me? And I'm saying Minneapolis to Chicago, six and a half, seven hours of driving usually. That's two 10 minute stops for the car. I think the human needs more than two 10 minute stops in seven hours of driving. And I've made that trip probably a dozen times now. And uh, in the winter, it's probably two 20 minute stops. In the summer, 10 minutes is, is enough two times. And you can move those around a little bit as well. I'll talk about that in detail. All right, so let's look at some different traveling scenarios. Um, I tried today in desperate attempt to put a picture in here in the left-hand corner of my car plugged into my silver wall unit like that, but the rakes and the snow shovel and the snow blower were kind of um, not making it look quite as glamorous as that white Tesla plugged in there to the Tesla wall unit. But this is an example of an at-home charger. 
the second one here is uh, my friend's leaf plugged in at his house. Uh, you can see there's different scenarios, but some kind of wall unit. This is a 240 volt unit that's mounted to your wall in your house. And that's what you use when you have your car parked overnight in your garage. Then when you're on the road, you have the two top right pictures. There's the Tesla solution and then the others, which would be the CCS standard, the green and white Electrify America. Um, the key thing to understand here is when you're at home, you have time. When you're on the road, you want to have power. So you want to plug into something that's really fast. And you can have the app on your phone, backup, plug in, makes it a lot easier to do it that way. And the other tip I would offer you is when you're road tripping and you're away from home, stay at a hotel that has a charger. You can go on the Marriott.com now, select only show me hotels that have EV charging at them. Um, you can go into Google Maps and type in EV charging for where you're going to be, and you will see just those hotels. And that's very easy. Um, to just back up and charge up with one of these kind. I've done that several times going out to Colorado to visit family out there, stayed at a uh, Marriott's A-loft out there and they have this exact setup. It's not exactly the same picture, but they have this exact same setup where they have um, a device where you can have two cars plugged in. And there's of course a supercharger, you know, like three miles down the road or another charger the other way, but it's just easy to stay at a hotel and you can just plug in overnight. So the key thing to take away here is 80 to 90% of your car's charging will happen at home in your garage overnight if you have that set up in your garage. Otherwise, you're going to be doing what I call the gas station model, which is you're going to go to a charger, charge up, then bring the car home, maybe plug it into 120 or not. Um, but then you're going to top off when you need more from the supercharger, like going to the gas station, but it's an electric version, okay? Um, we'll talk about plugging into these low-cost rates and uh, how that works in another slide, but we'll get there, okay? All right, so the question I always get is, Alan, well, <laughs> I'm one of those 30% of the people in Minnesota that don't live in a house. I live in a condo or an apartment, and we have charging or we'd like to have charging, but it's a challenge. What do I do? Uh, I can help you with that, reach out. That's exactly what I do all day is help condos and apartments get electric car charging setups in place. So basically you have to install something that looks like this very left picture. There are other companies out there that do this, but this just happens to be the charge point one because this charge point is the number one charging company out there. But basically you need to put a system like this in your garage. Um, or we put this middle picture we put something in a spot where two cars can share it and plug in to kind of break the chicken and egg cycle of which comes first, the charging or the electric car. And of course, in a condo, you're worried about power management and things like that. And that all happens through software and an application. And that's what this other picture is down here. All right, how far can you go on one EV charge? And I say, well, uh, the average American drives between 30 and 39 miles a day. 90% of all trips are less than 100 miles, and half the trips are less than five miles with one person. So my first question to you is, is how many days do you drive and you need to fill up if you started with a full tank of gas? And when people start to think about that, they're like, not very many, because most of the days I go somewhere and then I come back home, right? Or maybe they do, like they drive from here to Duluth or something like that, and they stay overnight where they can plug in. So those are the only days that you're gonna start thinking about charging away from home. And for, I know people that have purchased cars, driven them for five years now, and all they do is commute to and from their office to their home in their electric car, and all it does is charge at home. So it really kind of depends upon your situation, but most of the EVs out there today are between two and 300 miles of battery size. So how many days a year do you drive more than 300 miles? I mean, this is a circle of 250. And I know exactly how many times I've stopped halfway to Chicago or out to Sioux Falls or something like that. And all you do is drive until you find a supercharger, a fast DC charging location. And then you sit for 15 minutes while you go in and get something to eat or use the toilet or get a drink or whatever, coffee. And then you get in the car and go again. So it's not really that hard to manage. Um, and that's kind of what I try to tell people is how many times do you take those big long trips there's a lot of range anxiety. That word I just think is a completely made up uh, word for people. Uh, it just is an education issue really is what it comes down to. Today, the electric car takes less time than I need as a human on a road trip to charge up. Uh, cars, electric cars in the winter. This is a real picture. <laughs> I actually won through, a, I think it was a MRES fundraiser uh, many years ago to drive this Chevy Bolt at the time. This is a real picture that I took. 
This is, um, I had this car for like three days as kind of a, you know, give some money and then you get to you win the right to drive the car. And I really wanted to drive this car because I was thinking very seriously about buying this for my wife at the time. Um, but again, if you have a car that is going to go two to 300 miles, how many times is this going to be an issue? Electric cars don't, you know, they don't fall off in the winter that extreme, right? So you're just going to charge a little bit more. And I would say, okay, so let's say it's January. What if you have, instead of two to 300 miles, what if you have 150 to 250? How many days do you need to go past that level of charging, right? So it's just, it's just a little bit longer when you stop the charge or just one extra stop. It's not like you can't do it. I mean, I've driven all over in the winter and it's not a problem. So I always talk about, you know, the benefits of driving an electric car is you got a really big battery right between the four wheels on the floor of the car, underneath the wheel, basically. So that center of gravity presses down on all four tires and you have front and rear wheel drive with an electric car, there's two motors and they're very sensitive. So it's not a mechanical connection. So when you step on the brake or you step on the accelerator or the pedal, you can see the difference in the car. It really is very easy to drive in the winter. And of course you can keep it warm, right? You can warm the seat, warm the steering wheel or the whole cabin because you got an app on your phone. You just reach out and say, oh, warm the car. Or as I like to do, you can have it warming, quote unquote, running in your garage at 7 a.m. for your departure because it can be warmed up overnight. And then you can have the garage door still closed because it's not really emitting fumes, right? So uh, enjoy the 80 degree Caribbean breeze and enjoy your electric car in the winter. That's what I like to say. Um, total cost of ownership. Uh, this slide is one of my oldest slides from back in 2019. This is when the tipping point happened. This is when the Tesla Model 3 standard range was below the cost of the number one selling gas car sedan in America, which was a Toyota Camry. Now, I would like to point out a couple things of how much more it benefits the electric car since this time. This study was done with $3.10 gasoline. Uh, I haven't seen that number for a long time in the gas world, by the way. Not that I pay attention a lot, but I'm just saying we're well past $3.10. This is also using 13 cent electricity. I'm telling you, you can get electricity for three cents overnight by plugging into an EV program from your utility. Dramatically different numbers than this. And this was already in favor of the electric car four years ago. So we can get into the total cost of ownership. There's hundreds and hundreds of hundreds of total cost of ownership studies out there on the web if you want them. But we're well past, well past the cost of a gas car and electric car. The electric car is cheaper to run over the long run, which is the key thing to understand. Why? Because of gas and fuel prices and this maintenance. The maintenance is nearly non-existent, uh, I can tell you. So here's two Chevys. Pretty much the same size, relatively the same price point. Look at all these check marks on this Chevy Cruze that you need to keep the car in good warranty service. Now let's look down here at the bolt. So the first thing you do on the Chevy Bolt besides rotate the tires and change the air filter is you have to drain the coolant circuits at 150,000 miles. Yeah, so that $147 uh, oil change, yeah, it's just not happening in the electric world. The other question I always say is, have you done a lot of electric motor maintenance in your house recently? Like you've taken out your fan motor and taken good care of it. How about the refrigerator electric motor? Have you done anything with that recently? No, of course. You turn them on and they run for years and years and years. That's how it is with an electric car. The other thing I ask, people always ask me about is the batteries. We don't change the batteries out. The batteries are good for the life of the car, which is like 12 to 15 years. This is a Chevy Bolt battery on the left. This is a Tesla, uh, we'll call it a skateboard design where you see the red electric motors and the battery underneath. So typical new car electric warranty is gonna be eight years, 100,000 miles. Um, and the, the idea here is to understand how the battery wears out over time, right? So it doesn't go and just stop working, right? It's a very sophisticated battery management system that manages the life of that battery over many, many, many years. So it's about how far it charges up. That's what's considered a new or a used battery. And it's actually a key indicator uh, when you have a used EV, how well the battery is gonna do for you. 
And then let's talk about recycling. This is the topic that everybody's talking about today. What about the supply chain? What are we going to do with all those batteries in the future? Uh, well, we're going to recycle them. <laughs> That's what we're going to do. Uh, it's clear today there's already been new EV batteries made from only old EV batteries um, because some of the materials are more valuable. They're going to be recycled. That's just there's obviously a lot of work to do in that space to ramp up that that supply chain, but we're already seeing that discussion. And as far as supply chain, yes, it is a very different set of minerals and things that you need to build the electric car versus the gas car. And that's kind of the crunch that we're going through right now. And we're seeing that, you know, the automakers are trying to lock up large amounts of, of these minerals to uh, make sure that they've got enough for the next five, six, seven years so they can have the units because everybody is ramping up right now at the same time. Some of these costs have gone up really extreme, like the cost of lithium is up like 700% in the last few years. So it's a different mix for gas cars than electric cars. And we're kind of going through that process right now. Uh, we will see more and more recycling as you know the cars, quote unquote, come to the end of their life. Last slide uh, on gas versus an EV. This question comes up a lot. Uh, how much does gas cost in an EV? I will tell you that I pay $200 a year for fuel, quote unquote, for my EV to drive 20,000 miles. I, that is not an incorrect number. <laughs> I have many people that have come up afterwards and like, are you sure that's not per month, Alan? Because that's kind of what I'm paying for, for my gas car. And I'm like, no, it's $200 a year for 20,000 miles. If you charge overnight, that's the key is to get that low cost fuel. Um, the key thing I'd point out here is, is that most EVs are rated between 100 and 150 miles per gallon equivalent. The average gas car in America is 25 and going down thanks to the previous administration loosening up some rules. So yeah, people always come up to me like, oh, I'm getting way better than 25 miles per gallon. So, okay, well, you probably got a hybrid. And if you had a plug-in hybrid, you'd be even doing better, maybe 45. And if you had an electric car, you'd be doing 125. And if you're driving a bigger SUV or a truck, you're probably doing closer to 12 or six miles per gallon. So it's all about the fuel, the cost of fuel and the efficiency of the motor. That's what really makes the difference there. And I will save that slide for a different time since I'm running out of time. Um, my wish for you is to share the EV news. If you know other people that we should hear more about EVs, let me know or get me in touch with them. Uh, go drive some electric cars. There's plenty of electric cars around town at the Volkswagen dealer, at the Tesla dealer, the Chevy dealer. Um, there's vehicles to go take a test ride, make it a fun afternoon or a fun evening. Um, go drive them. I think you'll be really impressed when you see the total cost of ownership on some of those vehicles. It's just going to be like, wow, this is a fun ride. This does the job. And I'm saving so much money on that vehicle. Um, Commit that your next car will have a plug, save the money, get the efficiency, call Excel, ask them how much it would cost to, to charge your electric car. Uh, people often go, oh my gosh, I called Excel and they said my bill might go up by like 50% 50 from what I'm paying today. And I said, yeah, that's about right. But I said, but you're not spending $800 on gas. So you can afford to spend maybe another $50 on electricity, right? And they're like, oh yeah, I never kind of thought of that. So. Uh, we're a little past the vote. I hope you voted a couple of days ago, but voting is what makes a difference in a lot of these infrastructure packages. And with that, we will go to QA and I will leave it up for you there. So Ellie or Doug, do we have questions in the chat, things that we should address or should I just do some of the more common ones that I get asked? Ellie, do you see anything? I see a couple of them in there. I don't know who they're from. Why, why don't you go ahead, Ellen? Sorry, yeah. I was on mute. Go yeah, ahead. you want you got them? Okay. Go ahead. Um yeah, one road. I've heard you that you guys get longer battery life if you charge up to only 80%, unless for range reasons you need that last 20%. Is that true? Yes, that's true. I, I set my car to charge to 80% every night. And then when I'm going to Chicago, I charge it up and leave full. So I think mine is 270 five when it's at 80% and 350 when it's full. Um, just gives me a little bit more when I hit the road. Um, but yeah, usually just 80%. And I, and I plug my car in every night and every night it charged to 80% automatically by 6 a.m. 
Uh, so it's kind of like when I plug my phone in, I don't have to go in and set it or anything like that. It just wakes up in the middle of the night and fills up at the off-peak rate, and it's full by 6 a.m. every morning. Same thing for our Prius. Plug it in. Literally two and a half years ago, I set up the Prius. I've never changed it. It's full by 6 a.m. every morning. So, yeah. Awesome. Jerry would like to know how the Inflation Reduction Act will help us to buy an EV. Oh, well, let's see if I have. <laughs> I was prepared for that question because that's been a hot topic of question here. Let me see if I can go on. Let's, let's do this one real quickly first. Um, this question, and I, the two slides after this is the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, when I talk about, and people say, you know, that California phasing out of gas sounds pretty drastic. And I say, well, if you look around the world and see what the other commitments are to phase out the internal combustion engine, you would see a lot of 2030s, 2025, 2040. These are countrywide commitments. And then you have some of the cities. And here's where we are in the United States. We've got a few cities and now California committing to 2035. Of course, we don't have a date like this in Minnesota yet, but it just gives you a perspective. Look at this. We're talking 20 years in some cases, 15 years. This is the difference of um, just understanding the fossil fuel impact on their marketplace. So that's the price of gas and how it's changed over time. And here is the uh, Inflation Reduction Act. So the first thing I will tell you about the Inflation Reduction Act, everybody that's in the clean energy, EVs, uh, wind, sun, solar, grid updates, uh, electric car charging, all that, we're all studying the Inflation Reduction Act, trying to figure out what it is, how it works. So I'm going to just kind of give you the three or four slide overview right now, because a lot of it is still being written. <laughs> they don't have to publish it. Uh, the details until the end of December, uh, because that's when it's going to start affecting taxes. So the big answer to the Inflation Reduction Act is it's going to dramatically change for the better clean energy, electric cars, electric car charging, and several other things. Um, but the details are still being worked out. And it's a little bit of a confusing situation. So we had the old model of um, tax credits. Then we have between the date the bill was signed, August 16th, and the end of the year. And then we're going to have January 2023 through 2033, 10 years. So we're just at that time where we're transitioning from the old credits, the old tax models, to the new tax models. So I, there's a lot of confusion, <laughs> to be honest, if you were before that or in this period before we get to January, that talk to your, your tax person to help you with that. Um, there's, uh, there's a lot of restrictions around making those things work, like you had to actually have a purchase, a signed deal, et cetera. All right. Um, the two things that really are driving the electric car world are two things, critical minerals and battery components. And without going into too many details here, it's kind of a two-part win, if you want to think of it that way. You need to buy a car that has minerals that were sourced or, I'm sorry, extracted or processed in the United States or with a free trade partner that, or recycled in North America. So who is a country that is a free trade partner and uh, where was that battery, basically the materials to make that battery, where were they sourced from, okay? That's how you get an unlock 3750, okay? The other part of it is to get the other 3750 must be manufactured or assembled in North America. For those of us that are in the industry, we are seeing a massive, massive shift. We are now building in North America 13 of the biggest battery plants you have ever seen on the face of the earth. 13 have introduced new legislation or are breaking ground. So things are going to change very rapidly here. We were buying all these batteries from outside of the United States, mostly from Asia Pacific countries, specifically China. And so basically now with this, all those manufacturers have to set up shop in the U.S., and they have to start figuring out where they're gonna get those materials from. And that's why we're having such a drive on some of these rare earth minerals because everybody, you know, Ford, General Motors, Chrysler, Tesla, everybody's now shifting to, we gotta source these batteries from the right place to get our tax credit on our cars. 
And if they don't, then the competitive manufacturer of that automobile will be getting the credit. And it's made a really big surface out of that situation. Um, I won't go into this in too much in detail, but there is a tax credit for used EVs for the first time. This is a fantastic thing. Must be two years old, under $25,000, and you can get 4,000 or 30% off the vehicle, whichever it is. Of course, you have to qualify. You have to have a tax, you know, a tax that you can, uh, you know, that you would normally be paying. Uh, there's caps on that, things like that that are involved. But for, for now, we're going to have used EV tax credit. Um, more details on that later. Um, EV charging. Uh, this is a really big thing that is a little bit undefined, I would say. Um, the federal tax credit for charging equipment has been extended to through 2032, so 10 years more. Um, how to do it at the residential level, 30% off up to the cost of the equipment. Again, these are details that are going to be worked out. Call your tax person. Um, figure out the gory details because this is shifting at the speed of light here in the next uh, four to six weeks until things are really baked for the new tax year. And then I'm sure in, in 2023, we will have amendments to the tax code that will go back and change some of this over time. Um, but two and three wheel vehicles are eligible for the first time. Uh, how about electric tuk-tuks in Chicago and San Francisco and San Diego? I think you're gonna see some of that happening. It's going to be a lot of crazy things come in place. Um, there's a lot more going on there. Uh, like I said, you can look on the Internal Revenue Service, uh, the Department of Energy, uh, plugstar.com. There's a lot of different places to find information. But like I said, it all comes down to everybody's reading kind of the high level outline of the law and figuring out what does that mean for their particular part of the ecosystem. And in many cases, it means we're going to have to change the ecosystem to source those materials locally, process those materials locally, ramp up recycling. It's going to be a big shift in the industry. All right. Other questions, Ellie or Doug? Yeah, I'll hop around a little bit just because one came in that's still about the IRA. Um, is it a yeah. good idea to use the IRA to install a plug in the garage even before you buy an EV? Yes, if you can get a if you can get an EV uh, wall unit installed between now and the end of the year, you will get that back as a tax credit. Um, there's a little uh, window in there um, that you would be grandfathered in under the old old rules. Uh, good luck finding an electrician, and good luck finding a unit to put on the wall. It's been uh, it's been crazy, <laughs> crazy, crazy. Next question. All right. Um, can you talk a little bit about safety issues if batteries are exploding or low riding damage to batteries? And yeah, yeah, no sure. Um, yeah. So um, a couple things about batteries. Unfortunately, the Chevy Bolt had a manufacturing problem and they tracked it back to about 14,000 batteries that were misbuilt by the robot where it put the, uh, the place where the battery connector and the cable come together. And so there was a place where it shorted out and there were like seven to 10 fires, I think or maybe it was 14 fires. And there have been some Tesla fires, but it's been extremely overblown uh, to the point like, I, there's thousands of gas car fires every day, ones that go boom, like when they have an accident, right? The thing you have to understand about uh, electric car batteries is, it is a thermal runaway process. So it's a chemical process. So it takes time for the chemicals to heat up like minutes, right? So like five, seven, 10 minutes might go by and the battery management system will say, hey, you have a problem, park the car and get out. This is, there's something oh, wrong. Yeah, so it's a big difference in change of speed there. And, you know, gasoline cars go boom, thousands per day uh, in North America. Statistically, I think it's like 0.01% of the electric cars have ever had a problem with the battery. So, and there, it was tracked back to a great percentage of those back to a manufacturing problem. And kudos to Chevy and the Bolt, they've replaced all the Chevy Bolt batteries. It's been a fantastic deal because if you had a Bolt, you got a new battery. It was like resetting back the car back to the day brand new battery. And it had more miles in it when they got the new battery. So I think Chevy did a really good job of um, taking care of that problem. 
I have a I have another question about that. Um, that was yeah. my question. Um, is there is there a safety rating uh, in that big chart? You know, showing all of the all of the EV cars is safety rating one of those like crash tests and all of that? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there is. Um, it. So the thing you should know is all, I would say all EVs pass those safety crash tests for one reason. When you have that big battery in the belly of the car, that's just a massive solid piece of um, metal and plastic down there. So it's very safe because you, you, when you have that low center of gravity, you can't tip the car over and you can crash into the side of it and the front and the back will crush but not the place over the top of the battery because you have to structurally support the battery weight, which is really heavy. It's actually heavier than a gas uh, car, but it's evenly distributed. So structurally, they all get five-star ratings in crash tests from a side and front and rear impact. So yes, it is on that sheet, evinfolist.com. Go look at it, it's on the right side. So right, electric cars you. are very thank safe you. from a crash testing perspective. Thank you. Yep, go ahead. Um, Scott would like a little bit of elaboration on the Minnesota becomes a clean car state in January 2024 for 2025 models. Ooh, yeah. Okay, let me just whip through a couple of these here and see if I can find those slides for Scott. Somewhere down in here, that's the battery car fire one. Clean cars is uh, about right here. Yeah, right here. Um, so it was controversial at the time. I would say it's still controversial for some people. Uh, it's just basically means that we're going to join the group, the other states that are going to be a clean car coalition. Um, it just means that our parking lots, our automobile dealers will have to stock certain vehicles to meet certain emission standards. And the emission standards are super low and super easy but the first year, and then they grow over time, okay? Uh, I think personally, it's going to bring a lot more electric cars and uh, plug-in hybrids to our parking lots that we will have a choice of, because there's just a lot of cars we don't get today that are super popular, like a Toyota RAV4 that plugs in and gets 30 miles on uh, plug-in hybrid. That car is super popular, and there's just not enough of those around, right? Um, there's numerous examples like that uh, where we go forward. Transportation is the number one source of climate causing pollution. This is a way that we think we're going to address this from a framework perspective. Uh, we're joining these other states and it just means that the shift or the emissions modeling is at a higher level than the federal level, uh, which was relaxed under the previous administration. So we're kind of uh, moving out there if you wanna call it with a bunch of the other clean car states. Uh, I would suggest hit these two links down here at the bottom, freshenergy.org, what's up with clean cars, and freshenergy.org, myth-busting Minnesota and electric vehicles. There's all kinds of FUD out there, like trucks, blah, blah. I, I, they're just crazy stuff, and none of that stuff is true. It just means that there's a different choice at the parking lot. You don't have to buy them if you don't want to. Uh, on and on and on. There's a lot of, you know, you, it's just tractors are involved. No tractors have nothing to do with the clean car standard. There's a lot of just crazy fud out there. Other things. All right. Um, why do EVs have the large center console? Um, and why do they have a shift lever if they're electric? Um, <laughs> yeah, <versus button>? <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, there's a lot of, um, Creature comforts that I would say are still in some of the older cars as they transition over um, because they still make or manufacture, some, some manufacturers still use the, I'll call it the interior of the old fossil fuel cars and they just simply replace the drivetrain and the battery over time. Uh, that's one thing people like about Teslas. It is a bit jarring because it's very um, clean, minimalistic design. For some people that's just not their style. They don't like that. Um, but you just don't need all those gauges and buttons and bells and whistles because like we don't need to know the temperature of the engine anymore, right? We don't know, need to know how fast it's revving up or et cetera. I mean, I can come up with like a lot of those bells and buttons are just kind of gone. We don't, we don't need to know those things anymore. Uh, we, how fast is the electric motor turning over? It just works. Who cares? I mean, do you know these things about your refrigerator motor or your fan motor on your furnace? No. 
So it's, um, it's a transition period. Um, I will say that there's some cars that have done a better job of their electric cars feeling like the old gas cars, but yet they're new. And I will point out that I really like the Nissan Leaf, the latest version of that. It feels like the Nissan gas car, but it's electric. And it just, you know, it just kind of has that feel when you sit down of everything's kind of where it's supposed to be. And they kind of did a nice job of getting rid of the extra stuff. That's my point of view. Again, go drive some cars, go drive your favorite brand. I will be honest, in the old days, I used to think everybody's going to buy a Tesla or buy a Nissan Leaf or, you know, switch brands to one of these new electric cars. And that has absolutely been false. People love their brand. So if you're a BMW person, when there's an electric BMW, that's the one I'm going to go buy. I drive Toyotas. I'm waiting for an electric Toyota. I drive a Chevy. I'm going to get an electric Chevy. People love their brands and do not switch away from them. So go drive two or three of the cars in your brand or your nearest competitor to that brand and just kind of see what the state of the art is. I think you'll be really surprised. Uh, I can tell you, everybody that I've taken for a ride is just like, wow, I had no idea this is what was going on with the electric cars. So go ahead. What else? Uh, with the plug-in hybrid, does the gas engine get the normal 49 to 54 miles per, ga miles per gallon? Uh, it gets the miles per gallon that the engine gets, yeah. So like if in our plug-in Prius, um, I can give you a great example. When it's on electric, it's getting like 115, I think, in the Prius, 100, 115 miles per gallon because it's running off electricity. And then after about 22 miles in our 2019 Prius, I think that's the number, it switches over to the gas engine and then the gas engine gets that. If you do some sticker comparison, you'll find out that people way, way, way underestimate these numbers. If you're gonna, drive, if you're gonna wake up with 30 miles of electric every morning, how many days do you go over that 30 miles and how many miles are left after those 30 miles, right? That's where the gas engine is going to run. If you look at the sticker on that, uh, I think it's two thirds of the miles Toyota estimates will be electric miles because you have to think about, you know, take like a year of days. Some days you drive zero, some days you drive 200 miles, right? Most days you're just driving that, you know, 10, 15, 20, you know, whatever, five, seven, 10, 15, 20. It's that distribution of miles over those days. And when you cut 30 miles off the bottom of every day, then you only have a certain small number of miles left for the gas engine to run. And people way underestimate that, way underestimate that. I've had numerous people talk about that at in-person presentations like this. And they're just, yeah, I, I just thought that like 30 miles was a, such a small number, but it's 30 miles every day. That's the key part. Other questions? Uh, is there a rough cost or range to install an EV charging system in an apartment or condo building? Oh, you should call me <laughs> and talk about that one-on-one because -on -one, that's my day job. Um, there's a lot of factors there. Um, the units themselves um, are probably $2,000 or $3,000. So I'll just say, uh, because you got to get wiring to them and the power room needs to be upgraded in many cases. So you have a wiring distribution situation. Um, in, a, in your garage at home, right, your two cars or three car wide garage, you know, you're, you're 100 feet from probably your electrical panel, right? In an apartment or a condo, you might be 500 feet away from the panel where your power is going to come from. So you got to put in a lot more wiring. Um, the other factor that happens in multifamily homes and multi dwelling units, which are fancy names for apartments and condos, um, you have to do power management a lot of times. Uh, the building has to control how much power is being used at a certain time. And there's financial reasons why you want to do that. Because in a commercial building, like an apartment or a condo, you're paying the kilowatt hours and you're paying the demand charge. You do not want to increase that demand charge because that's a multiplier for all of the electricity you use. Okay, So it pays to put in that smarter charger that will not have every car turn on at 12 midnight. It will spread them around, but still get them filled up. And that's what the software, the cloud software does. Uh, I'm not, I'm gonna give you a number. I'm just trying to give you some context to what drives the number. So at my house, if I put in a charger, it might be 1500 to $3,000 in a residential. I think, 
I'm pretty sure that Excel's study was $2,200 was their average install price for like a thousand uh, homes to have an EV charger installed. I think that was somewhere around $2,000. I would tell you that it's probably closer to uh, three to $5,000 in a condo or an apartment. It depends. Um, you have more wiring, uh, generally speaking. You sometimes have to upgrade the power. And so that's a situation. Um, with all that said, I might say it's four, five, six thousand dollars $6,000. That's kind of the range I would give. It depends upon. Uh, the point that I always make when it comes to condos and apartments is it's a profitable business, right? So you're gonna, when, you go, when you go to the gas station down on the corner, hey, did you notice that's a profitable business for them, right? That business model is now moving to your garage, your basement, your condo, your building. You're now going to have the choice to either price the product lower or what are you going to do with the profit in your condo or your apartment, right? So the other thing I would point out that people say, well, I, you know, I got to spend like three, $4,000 to put this charging system. And I'm like, yeah, but you're also saving ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 worth of, of gas over the life of the vehicle, right? If you save $2,000 a year and the vehicle lasts 12 years, which is normal, that's $24,000 worth of savings. And I would also point out that it's a huge amenity if you ever sell or move out, out of that apartment or that condo. Um, it's, I, I've worked with a number of people that said, I'm not getting an electric car. I haven't, you know, I'm going to order one, but it's going to be a while. But I want my parking spot electrified. I want an EV ready garage because I know that people will ask for that. And it's kind of like upgrading your bathroom or your kitchen countertops or things like that. It's a nice amenity that people want. But if you want, call me or reach out to me. We'll talk about that. Other questions? Um, to get the tax credit, do you need to itemize your taxes? Uh, you need to fill out, I want to say it's eight, it, IRS form 8957 or 37 or something like that. There's a worksheet and you answer all the details, all the questions. Uh, the key thing is to wait for the auto manufacturers because they're going to say this car qualifies, this is where the minerals were sourced from, this is where the processing of the minerals happened, this car qualifies for X amount of credits or not. So that will all get added to the electric car out there. But yes, if you're going to take a tax credit, I want to say it's 8937 or something like that is the IRS form. It's Alternative Fuels Worksheet IRS. I think we'll probably get it to you if you do a search on that. Other do, questions. You, do you foresee new tech in battery in the future? Oh, yeah, it's changing all the time. Um, as I said earlier, the miles are going up and the cost is coming down. Uh, we just have a tremendous rush right now on the supply chain because basically everybody's in now. All the electric car companies have been on this for a while, but now the fossil fuel companies have said, we're not gonna make gas engines after 2035 or 2040 or 2045. So now everybody's just bidding up the price of the raw materials. Um, but yeah, battery tech is changing every day. Um, I would tell you that almost every week now there is a quote unquote amazing breakthrough. <laughs> um, yeah, there are breakthroughs. Uh, but you can charge batteries really fast. You know, that's the common claim nowadays. Oh, we have a new research from the university of so-and-so. You can now charge electric car batteries in seven minutes, da 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 That's not new news. You can charge batteries really fast. You can't recharge batteries fast over 10, 15 years. That's the challenge. So technically you can do a lot of things different than we're doing them today. It's all about that warranty and all about the life of the battery over time. And primarily it's about lowering the cost. So some electric cars today have 525 miles of range. It's just a $125,000 car because that battery is really big, right? So why is the Nissan Leaf and the Chevy Bolt, whether they are, they have a smaller battery and they get 268 miles off the battery, right? So it's a lot of, a lot of battery tech is changing out there. Um, but there's quote unquote breakthroughs and then there's kind of lots of uh, stories for social media. So it's all what, about warranty and the miles and the dollars per mile, so to speak. What about uh, alternatives to lithium? Yeah, oh sure, absolutely. Iron phosphate. Uh, so lithium is, you know, when someone says it's a lithium battery, that, that's kind of like saying French fries. You can get French fries from hundreds of people that make French fries, right? 
it's it's got to be a lot more detailed chemistry than that, right? Because there's lithium iron phosphate, blah, 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 with the smaller amounts of minerals in that name, right? So there's a lot of different um, ways of looking at that where it's just, it's the chemistry of the battery that is the part of it. And there's a lot of experimentation there with the cathode and the anode on the battery. And um, the other question I get around batteries related to the tech is, um, Technically speaking, the battery loses a little bit of range every time you charge, a little bit. I mean, like a very small amount. So it doesn't just you know, go for so long and then die. It's all, every time you charge it, it's fading out because it makes a little path through the electrons of the battery. But the warranty is what you have to think about. What is the warranty at eight years, 100,000 miles? Can you buy an extended warranty? That's why people charge their electric car to 80% because I want a really high rating on my battery when I sell my car that it quote unquote is in excellent shape. It's kind of like when you had a gas car, you say, look, I did the maintenance, you know, change the oil every you know, 6,000 miles or 4,000 miles, whatever the number is, I have excellent service records, right? That's a big selling factor for a gas car to show that it's been well-maintained. The same thing happens with electric cars. It's like, test the battery, show me what the life of the battery is. <clears throat> uh, how about solid state batteries? Uh, yeah, they've been around for a while. There's a lot of promise there. Um, again, you know, we can do it. Can you can can you do it cheaper and does it last long enough for the war? Can you warranty it and can you lower the price? That's kind of the two factors. You know, you can you know you can change the levers, but you gotta gotta be able to warranty it and it's gotta last a long time and it's gotta be at a low price. So it's kind of the old pick two out of three. Well, the industry wants three out of three, and so if you can beat that game, then you're gonna win. But uh, yeah, there's a lot of changes out there. A lot of people testing things. Um, it's just where we are. Lithium ion batteries uh, with more cobalt and less lithium is kind of the trend right now. And charging them up X number of times when you do road trips. Um, you know, the new Tesla superchargers are 350 kilowatts uh, with a spike of over 900 at the first three, three, two or three minutes. Um, it's all about the life of the battery and the warranty that really comes down into play. So yeah, lots of lots of solid state batteries and flash capacitors, and there's a lot of things going on in that space, but um, it all comes down to that warranty and will it last 10, 15 years? Alan, I got a quick question. Um, uh, what about vehicle to grid type things? Are you seeing any of that? Yeah. I know, so I know school buses are getting into it so they can cost justify, you know, the prices of the buses, but what about in cars? Where's that at? Yeah, so two interesting topics there, vehicle to grid or vehicle to X is the new buzzword. Um, I have to say, I think the Ford F-150 has done a great job of talking about vehicle to X or keeping the lights on after your house has had a tornado outage or whatever. Um, that has been researched and studied in depth a lot more in Europe than in the United States. It has been in the electrical code book for a long time, but we really haven't seen anybody take advantage of that. School buses are basically going all electric in the next five years. It's an easy, easy use case because, hey, we know exactly how far the bus is going to go every morning and every night, and we know it's going to sit during the middle of the day in many cases. So you have a very strong model to work with. So a financial company might say, hey, school district, we will provide you all the school buses that you need at the times you need it to go the distance you need to go. But here's what we want. When they're parked, we want them plugged into the electrical grid, and then we're going to sell uh, frequency voltage you know, services back to the electric grid because these are big batteries sitting there. Um, as far as the vehicles, uh, the trucks and things like that, again, a truck like a Ford F-150 is a 125 kilowatt hour battery, right? Um, you know, like in a Prius, you might have like a 30 kilowatt hour battery because it has a gas engine backup. My Tesla is 75 kilowatt hour battery. So the batteries are getting bigger for trucks because they got to haul and pull. So they need more energy. So the battery is bigger. So you have a higher likelihood that the, there's going to be more energy in the battery at the end of the day, right? Um, and I think Ford has done a really good job of pushing out there that vehicle to grid or vehicle to X. Um, they do require some uh, very unique uh, charging equipment to make that work and some very interesting wiring at home to be able to pull energy back out of that battery from the truck back to the house. 
but um, it's happening. Uh, you know, going forward, uh, I, I forget the exact stats, but either batteries in homes or batteries in cars are going to be tapped for a lot of quote unquote grid resiliency going forward. And when the, or when the sun is shining, we're going to fill up the cars or when the wind is blowing, we're going to fill up the cars. Uh, and so that, that variability is already showing up in Hawaii, California, uh, Norway, and some of the European Union countries. We're starting to see a lot of that give and take to and from the, the vehicles. Well, I just, I really want to thank you. This has been fascinating. Uh, we've got time maybe for two more questions if somebody wants to jump in. Ellie, do you have any more? Uh, is there an update on Tesla opening up their charging stations to other brands? Oh, yeah. The news came out this week, last week. Tesla has rebranded and renamed their Tesla charging network to be the North America Charging Standard. Uh, and that's been a, a topic that's come out. And they have opened up all the information to all of the cars. So everybody can now switch. All, all the vehicle manufacturers can switch to a Tesla plug and a Tesla charging network. Um, We'll see. Uh, that's been, uh, you know, for there's a little bit of history there. So CCS has been the other plug standard that we've had in North America, which is another European number. Chatamo has been here, but mostly used in Asia Pacific. But in North America, Tesla was the first vehicle and Tesla could not get the power that they wanted from the grid into the car. So they went to a higher new standard that they defined, okay? That's why the Tesla plug is designed the way it is. That's why the Tesla chargers work the way they do. And everybody's like, well, why didn't they follow the standard that was already there? They went above the standard. That's why, because it's a competitive advantage because people want to charge their car so much faster. And that's why people like a Tesla because there is a network and it charges really fast and it's guaranteed or you know, it's up and working, right? Um, but CCS uh, is being adopted as a standard as well. Uh, the challenge is which way are we going to go? We don't know. Uh, Tesla just opened that up and uh, Tesla has about two to one plugs out there for fast charging. So Tesla network is strong, reliable, and twice as big as the CCS standard, but we'll see what uh, becomes the North America standard going forward. But yeah, they just opened that up like in the last week or two. Okay. Ellie, one more? Um, any possibility of wireless charging? Yeah, it's being tested in Europe. Um, takes a lot of energy uh, to <laughs> make electricity jump from a wire to, you know, a, a, you know, a pantograph or, you know, a receiving site. Um, but it's being tested. Um, kind of like uh, if you have, you know, if you drive into a parking spot and you put the car over the top of the charger that's on the cement, you can get that down to like six to eight inches. Uh, it's just not quite as efficient as plugging in the plug. I think it's like 40% less efficient or something like that. A um, lot of research, uh, a lot of things going on there, but uh, plugging in the car gets you a lot higher efficiency. Um, and we'll see. Uh, there has been some studies that are underway now. Electric roadway uh, just came out last week, I think, was the electric roadways in, I want to say, Norway or Europe. Search for that. You'll find the story on it. Well, I, I, Alan, again, I just want to thank you so much. It's It's been so informative. Um, yeah, and thank you. Really, really appreciate what you've uh, presented us. Uh, and this being videotaped uh, will be up on our YouTube site probably within 30 days. So if people want to share this with uh, others, uh, you'll be able to you know send them to that YouTube site for MRES. The other thing I just want to mention to everyone tonight before we break off is that uh, uh, we, MRES, are still looking for, uh, you know, uh, help us to, uh, to the max kind of thing. Give to the max. So if, you, uh, if you've received an email from MRES or you're interested in doing it, please go to our website or your email and, uh, you know, give us, give us some support. We're Apple Eve supplying this great information free to everybody. So we would love your support in doing it in the, going forward. So thanks again to everybody that was involved tonight. Alan, I can't thank you enough. Thank you. And, uh, and uh, we, will, uh, we will all uh, break off now into the MRES uh, Board of Directors meeting. So thanks again. Thank you, Alan. Take care. Thanks, Chris. Bye, everybody. Thanks, Alan. Yep, good to be with you.